Welcome to the 8th Annual Seattle Area. The Seattle Epidemiologic Research and Information Center, in collaboration with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA Employee Education System, and the University of Washington Departments of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, presents the 8th Annual Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Clinical Research Methods Summer Session. Good morning. Welcome to the 8th Annual Seattle ERIC Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Clinical Research Methods Summer Session. My name is Ed Boyko. I'm the course director. The title of today's course is Epidemiologic Aspects of Military Post-Deployment Health Conditions, Natural Disasters, and Terrorism. I'm pleased to introduce to you today Dr. Dean Kilpatrick. He is a distinguished university professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and director of the National Crime Victims Research and Treatment Center at the Medical University of South Carolina. He and his colleagues have conducted epidemiologic studies of numerous disasters, including the Loma Prieta earthquake, Hurricanes Andrew and Hugo, the 2004 hurricanes in Florida, the Pan Am 103 terrorist bombing, and the 2001 terrorist attacks in the World Trade Center in New York City. Uh, today he'll, he will be speaking about epidemiologic aspects of natural disasters. Dr. Kilpatrick. Well, in, in the last session, I mentioned uh, that we had been able to pull together, uh, thanks to the enormous uh, competence of, of uh, people at the New York Academy of Medicine, uh, a cross-sectional study um, that had been conducted five to eight weeks after 9-11. And uh, we were fortunate to have uh, several things published from that, um, including in the New, New England Journal of Medicine, Galea et al. Uh, never been happier to be an et al. in my life. I don't know whether I was at or all, but, uh, but nonetheless, that was, a, that was a good thing. Uh, we had originally thought about trying to do a longitudinal study with that original sample, but uh, human subjects issues and other kinds of things meant that we would have had to get locational information as opposed to having a totally anonymous uh, survey if, if we had gone longitudinal up front. Not to mention had more money we would have needed to have. Sound like Yoda here. Uh, but at any rate, uh, what, uh, what we did though is that we immediately upon doing the first study uh, tried to get funding uh, to do a longitudinal study. And this is really the design of the cohort sample that we did. So it was about six months afterwards when we were able to get the longitudinal cohort going. And I won't read all that to you, but it, but it was conducted in the metropolitan New York area in English, Spanish, and Chinese. And you may recall that I, I previously said that one beautiful thing about telephone interviewing from a centralized facility is that it does facilitate being able to use multiple languages as a part of that, and that was true of this study. So uh, again, these are the longitudinal data points, and actually we have some more now, but, uh, but I'm not going to be able to get into that. This is an illustration of post-traumatic stress disorder, and you're probably wondering, who are all these little people? Well, each of the people, and I need to thank Sandro Galea for this, illustrating this, but these are people, uh, this represents the population of New York in terms of people, uh, all, all the people represent all the people in, in New York. And, uh, and the yellow people uh, represent people who developed post-traumatic stress disorder. The red group are those who were directly affected and the blue group are the people who were not directly affected. And so you can see uh, a couple of things from this, one of which is there's more people who are not directly affected in New York than people who are directly affected. You can also see that uh, the, the people who develop PTSD, the prevalence is higher among those who are directly affected than those who were indirectly affected or not directly affected. But there are some people who were not directly affected who in fact did develop PTSD. Um, this represents uh, what happens if you're looking six to nine months uh, 
after September 11th. And the lavender, or whatever color that is, I went to school a long time ago. We didn't have all the colors, so I'll need some help from the audience as to how you would describe that color. But at any rate, that shows uh, that the people who had current PTSD or the, is defined as within the last month. And one of the things that you can see there is that, that basically a lot of people who had PTSD had improved uh, over the six to nine months afterwards. And secondly, you can see that, again, uh, there are more people uh, among the directly affected group than, than the indirectly affected group that, that, um, that still have PTSD as well. This, uh, if you can see it, illustrates it a, a slightly different way, which it shows the longitudinal trajectory of, um, of PTSD among the group that was directly affected and the group that was indirectly affected. And uh, what, what you can see is, is that among the directly affected, I mean, it really was about 15% of those had uh, DSM-4 PTSD uh, five to eight weeks afterwards. And that basically, if you were then looking at, uh, you know, within about uh, five or six months afterwards, that that uh, rate had gone down substantially for both the direct and the indirectly affected group. However, there's an interesting thing there as well, which does show that there appears to be somewhat of a rebound phenomena um, one year and two years later. Um, now, there's several reasons why that might be true. Um, one of the things is, is that uh, you, you hear about anniversary reactions when you're working with traumatic stuff. And I would just ask you, would there be anything uh, about uh, an anniversary coming up that might remind somebody about what happened, aside from the incessant TV coverage, uh, the time of the year, the date of the calendar? I mean, there's just all kinds of cues that might tend to remind people about what's going on. But the point here that I, uh, I really want to make is, well, the points I want to make are two. One is that there is an improvement for a lot of people. And, and secondly, um, it looks like the people who are directly affected um, you know, have more of a problem than the people who are indirectly affected. And I guess my third point out of the two that I was going to make is that there appears to be more of an anniversary reaction and even an increase in the, in the rate uh, among the directly affected group, okay? Here's a similar thing for major depression, just to say that it's not all PTSD, that depression is also something that's going on too. And you see a lot of the same general findings there, with the exception that, uh, that it looks like the improvement um, you know, occurs a bit more for the directly affected group. And you don't quite see, because depression maybe is not as specific to exposure to a disaster, you see uh, kind of less of a difference between the directly affected and the indirectly affected people with respect to depression, particularly as you go out to the one and two year anniversaries, okay? Um, and this is um, people who were south of uh, 110th Street, which would be in the sort of the, the, the major center of the, of the disaster where the trade, trade centers were. And uh, you can see a similar pattern there. And this is limited not to the whole community of New York, but just among the people who, who were residing in the place that was most, uh, most affected. But you do see a similar pattern there as to where they are actually showing uh, a, an initial decline, but then they're showing uh, you know, somewhat of an increase at those, those anniversaries, the last two assessments. Um, this is a colorful slide. Uh, and um, the main thing that I wanted to, uh, to show you here is that particularly if you look at the, the bar that's on the, the far left, these are people who had probable PTSD or major depression. We, we only call that probable because, uh, you know, there was not an official clinician to uh, bless their diagnosis. I mean, they met all the DSM criteria for either major depression or for PTSD. And the thing about it is, is that um, about 20% of them received uh, immediate counseling. 
And then there was about another 20% or so who uh, got some type of de delayed counseling. I mean, this could be one session. I mean, you know, in other words, it's not a really uh, extensive definition there. But the important part is, is that basically 60% of them never got any counseling at all. And so one of the things that people think is going to happen after a disaster is that they think there's going to be this deluge of people who are going to come in for mental health counseling. In fact, most of the people, even who have a major, you know, Axis I diagnosis, or, I mean, there's lots of other diagnoses they could have, but even if you limit it to just PTSD or depression, most of the people who meet diagnostic criteria will not seek counseling of any type at all. Uh, the other thing is that, that uh, the directly affected people and the all other respondents, I mean, it just shows that, uh, that there's some logic going on here in that the people who seek counseling are, are a bit more so among the directly affected, but that in any case, most of the people who have problems who would be the ones that you would really care about are not going to come forward to seek treatment. Uh, without going through... Um, how many logistic regressions and uh, multi, multivariable logistic regressions you can dance on the head of the pen. I thought I would sort of summarize some, some findings that we found in this study uh, about um, emotional problems defined as either PTSD or depression and what the, the risk factors and protective factors are. First of all, there was a proximity thing going on, so people who were closest to the event were, uh, were more likely to have problems than people who were f further away. Uh, minority ethnic group members, actually particularly Hispanics, and, uh, were more likely to have problems than others, although there's always a confound there with income in many cases that makes it difficult to sort that out. Uh, people who were injured or who felt like they were almost injured, uh, those who witnessed other people being hurt, those who actually lost somebody or, you know, there was a, a family member who, or a friend who died, uh, those who in, incurred uh, significant property damage or financial vocational loss. This turned out to be a big issue, and I think, uh, you know, it, it, there was a lot of economic damage to the community, and, and so people who, who were, suffered some losses because of, uh, you know, lost their job because of this and all that, they were more likely to have problems. Uh, women were more likely than men, although this is always, is this a reporting phenomena or is this, uh, I mean, you know, as um, somebody, I told somebody once, I mean, guys want, at, w will not ask for directions, so why would they admit to the fact that they have problems? So uh, we don't really know whether that's a reporting phenomena or whether it's an actual thing. And then uh, social support and low social support was a big risk factor. So people who did not have access to social support were more likely to develop problems. There are actually some uh, protective factors too. And uh, one, surprisingly, or maybe, is older age. If you're older, maybe it's just that we don't understand the situation as well and so we're not as upset. But at any rate, if you're older, you actually do better, which is not what most people think, but it's true, and there have been lots of studies uh, in addition to ours that have shown that. Um, if, you were, uh, if you were a rescue worker, uh, you actually did better. I mean, this is consistent with some of the things that we had talked about previously. Again, if you have social support available, that's a protective factor. If, uh, if your neighborhood that you, you were living, uh, you know, can be characterized as being a very cohesive neighborhood, that was a protective factor. If you had support from your family, that was protective. And if you had uh, limited uh, financial or resource impact. So all those are protective factors. So in a lot of very complicated analyses, these were the things that were the risk factors and the protective factors. Um, Changing the subject radically here now, but I need to do that so that we can get, get all this in. I'm going to, uh, are any of you in, the, in another course about uh, uh, genetic epidemiology? Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, so, uh, well, it's a good thing that the, the teacher of the other course is not here because uh, this, is, uh, this is a clinical psychologist does the best he can trying to walk through some very complicated material. Uh, 
But anyway, what I want to do is to talk uh, about a study that we've just done in Florida, and, and I want to give you a little preamble to that, uh, and it's about uh, candidate gene association studies. And what those studies are is they basically are examining a correlation between variations or a polymorphism in a specific gene and variation in an outcome or a phenotype. And don't worry, I'm going to connect all this up before we get through. Uh, this is uh, thanks to my colleague uh, uh, Kara Stan uh, Conan. Uh, this is just a, a kind of an illustration or one possible illustration of what we're talking about. You have the genome and then you've got uh, within the genome you've got a pair of chromosomes and then you've got a spot on that that pair. You've got a gene there and then you've got a site on the gene. So that's that's really that has some variation in it. Um, and uh, uh, Karen Stan told me that I should say that this is a, this is a probably a grossly oversimplification of uh, how complex this is and so I hope you will forgive me since I don't really know what I'm talking about about this so she said for me to say that uh, <laughs> anyway and that people use these terms interchangeably all over the place and it's very confusing for everybody even if you do know what you're talking about uh, the gene by environment interaction uh, is some, some work uh, which I'll be describing in just a second. But it's basically a model that is saying that the effect of variation in a gene on risk for an outcome or a phenotype is basically conditional on exposure to some type of environmental risk factor. So it's an interactional model. It's not a main effects model. It's not saying, you know, gene equals disease. It's saying that gene, uh, if you give some variation in terms of exposure to environmental stressors, uh, then that interaction may be related to the disorder or the phenotype. And one advantage of the gene environment interaction studies is that it may help us understand why it is that exposure to the same environmental risk has different effects. So in other words, not everybody who's exposed to an environmental stressor shows the same phenotypic uh, or outcome effects. So why is that? Well, this may be one reason why. Um, what I want to talk about is really an example, using the example of major depression, because this has been one of the things that's been studied a lot in terms of psychiatric um, gene environment <coughs> interactions. So uh, without going into detail, there's, there is a lot of data that suggests that major depression is heritable to some degree, not to 100 percent degree, but to some degree. And there's also a very strong effect um, or, or strong evidence base over the years that, uh, that environmental stressors are also risk factors for depression. So um, now the environmental uh, risk factors include low socioeconomic class, various types of, of stressful life events have been shown for years to be related or to increase the risk of depression. Uh, but if you want to include genes here, there's a lot of genes. Uh, there's a lot of sites on genes, and how do you get started in terms of what to look for? So if you're looking for a candidate gene, I mean, uh, some folks have suggested that basically you need to be looking at a common disorder, but you also need to be looking at a gene that, ha that is sort of common. And by the way, in, in genetics, I'm told by my friends who know more than I do, that, uh, that a common uh, variant in a gene is considered to be something that's, that's more than 1%. All right? So 1% sounds pretty low to me, but, but that's common in genetics, evidently. It should be uh, that the function of the gene, if you can, sh uh, can show, might be in, in implicated in, in the disorder, the biology of whatever disorder you're looking at. If there's some evidence that maybe the gene's related um, to the disorder, and then if you can show that there's some reactivity of the disorder in terms of, of environmental risk factors. Um, now, you might be asking, what kind of gene are we talking about? Well, 
There's a gene that's called the serotonin transporter gene, or 5-HTT, HR, you know, whatever. Uh, a lot of, has a, a lot of different ways of describing this. And this is a depiction of this. And that's a common polymorphism, and it's a lot more common than 1%. In the promoter region of the gene, which basically the promoter region uh, regulates the expression of the gene, uh, it's also sort of a target for S SSRIs, which have been used for depression. Um, and it's, it's got uh, two functional variants, I mean, one of which is the long, which has more tandem repeats. And basically, that is more efficient, and it, and it really winds up producing more serotonin, okay? The short version is less efficient, and so therefore it produces less serotonin. And so if you're genotyping that gene, you have three possibilities. You, have, you can have either a long, long, you can have a short, short, or a combination of a short and a long. Okay, so this is, how many of you remember Saturday Night Live and Father Guido Sarducci? <laughs> this is Father Guido does genetics, and so the, any questions I should ask? Uh, if so, I'll call Kara Stan and she can answer them. Anyway, uh, there's a, a really, uh, I think, landmark study uh, that is done by Ashram Caspi and Terry Moffat and colleagues that was published in uh, Science in 2003. And basically, uh, this reports the results of a longitudinal study of a birth cohort in New Zealand. And New Zealand's great because basically people don't move around much and you can find them. And so they started when these people were two years old and they've been following them repeatedly. And in this science article, uh, it was based on an assessment that had been done when they were, uh, when they were 26. So, and, and actually the follow-up rate in location and being able to do this assessment when they were 26 included, it was either 97 or 98 percent of the entire sample. So, it's amazing. We should all move to New Zealand to do our studies as far as I can tell. Anyway, what they did is that they uh, uh, assessed this polymorphism of the serotonin transporter gene. They looked at environmental stressors both during childhood and uh, when they were adults. And they also looked at major depression measured four different ways. So it was a very robust measurement. Um, what they found when they were trying to predict the phenotype of, of the major depression was they found no significant main effect for genotype on depression, meaning that what, whichever of these three forms of the gene you had on the serotonin transporter gene, it did not matter. You were no more likely to be depressed whichever one of those you had. So no genetic main effect. Now the environmental stressors, both the childhood ones and the life events that happened while adults, were both significant at a main effect level in terms of predicting the likelihood of having depression measured several different ways. And then there was a significant uh, gene environment interaction, which is that the, the short version, which again is the one that produces less serotonin, um, basically uh, it was a risk factor for depression, but only under conditions of the high stressor exposure. So again, an interaction with the SS uh, being depressed, but only if they had the high, uh, you know, the high stress exposure. And then the long version of the gene, the LL version of the gene, actually was protective factor, even given stressor exposure. Now this is an important study, and it's been replicated several times. There have been a couple of, of studies that have not replicated for a variety of reasons. But anyway, it's been a very, uh, a, I think, a, a, a really landmark uh, study. So the questions uh, that we looked at with respect to disasters uh, is, could we replicate these Caspi et al. findings for major depression in the context of an epidemiological telephone survey? I mean, as you can tell, that's about all we've done is done telephone surveys. And so the concept of doing genetic stuff in a telephone survey does not immediately come to mind as something that's real feasible. But we said, well, we've done a bunch of other stuff that people said we couldn't do. Can we do this? Then another thing we wanted to find out is that since we've shown before in our disaster research and other people have that social support is important, 
how does that fit in? And does that further moderate a gene environment interaction? And then thirdly, um, for reasons that I don't have time to get into, wanted to look at PTSD uh, and wanted to see how that would work in terms of like, well, there's the same thing, there's a serotonin uh, transporter gene if we look at a gene environment interaction. Will that uh, obtain to, to PTSD as well as to, uh, you know, as well as to depression? So anyway, uh, we just we did a study, and uh, and we actually got some funding from uh, the National Institute of Mental Health to do this study after the Florida hurricanes. And these, this is the the cast of characters. And I want to particularly uh, acknowledge. Uh, I mean, Sandro was involved in this as well as Kirsten Conan, who I mentioned before, who's at Harvard, and Joel Galarnter, who's a VA guy. I mean, who's at the the New Haven VA and who's. Uh, very, 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 very smart, um, but he's the genetics uh, genetics guy. Um, this is a pictorial um, depiction of what a hurricane looks like a little bit before all the trees blow down. Um, so anyway, the questions we wanted to look at was after this uh, disaster, which I'll talk about in a minute, would it be possible to expand the epidemiological data collection procedures traditionally used for survey research to include collecting biological samples? Could we actually conduct genetic analyses on these samples? And then could we combine the genetic and psychosocial data for the gene environment interaction analyses? This is poor Florida. Uh, and basically, what you can see is it got hit by four hurricanes. Uh, one of them, Ivan, hit the panhandle of Florida over to the, to the left. And then uh, there's some poor devils who got hit by three of these things, the group in red there. And then a fair number of people got hit by two of them. And then, uh, you know, uh, the rest of them got hit by one. But at any rate, they had more than their share of bad luck. This was the counties that we sampled for our study. Uh, in other words, we sampled the ones that had been uh, hit uh, you know, by one or more of the hurricanes. And then what we did, uh, we used uh, random digit dial methodology to survey. And, uh, uh, and actually, we had an oversample of older folks because we wanted to get a large enough sample there to look at that. Is that even among this group that, that shows less vulnerability can you find the gene environment interactions uh, there uh, or risk and protective factors among the older folks. So all, uh, all in all, we had um, uh, 1,543 uh, older and younger uh, uh, adults from Florida. They were in the counties that were directly affected. We did this again in either English or Spanish. By the way, this was a $275,000 project, just to, to mention. Uh, you know, when I said the telephone stuff is cheap, and that's, so that's the total, total tab for this whole study. We randomly selected one respondent from each household using the re most recent birthday method. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you can either come up with a grid or you can just ask people who in the household had the most recent birthday, and that actually produces a, a, a random distribution of, of respondents, and so a lot of folks have gone to that because it's easier than going through a grid of every who all lives in the house. So we redialed each non-answered call up to five times at different times of the day on, on different days. I mean, usually you would do more than five, but as I say, this was, this was a cheaper study. We assessed demographic, social support, hurricane exposure. Social support, we dichotomized into the uh, those with the uh, lowest social support scores and the lowest third of scores. Uh, and then high hurricane exposure was defined as two or more of being present for hurricane force winds, meaning you didn't evacuate, you were there during it. Uh, you had significant property damage, you were displaced for your home more than two weeks, or excuse me, more than a week, and then uh, loss of at least two basic or two or more basic uh, utilities. Uh, the saliva samples were collected at the end of the interviews doing these uh, pre-assembled uh, uh, pre uh, kits with mail bags. We assessed post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression, and generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, 
And again, the overall participation rate among eligible individuals was, uh, was 81%. So again, this was, was a, uh, you know, we got a pretty good participation rate. This is actually, we mailed out with the kits. At the end of the interviews, we asked people, you know, would you be willing to do this? And this is the instructions that we did with uh, my lovely assistant, uh, Vicki, being the model in terms of that. But, uh, I mean, you know, the part of this is you had to kind of idiot-proof it a little bit, and for the most part, that worked. Uh, they did get a couple of samples back where people had peed in the bottle as opposed to follow these <laughs> instructions, and so that was not aesthetically pleasing nor, nor useful in terms of the genetics. So in order of identifying prevalence of PTSD, major depression, and GAD, um, and then the, the, this is just the uh, objectives, and I'll go through these quickly, very quickly, because I will be giving you the, the you know, how we did on those in just a second. Uh, but we did predict that if you had the short allele of the serotonin transporter gene uh, of that locus, it would be associated with greater levels of major depression and PTSD as a function of hurricane exposure and pre-existing social support. Um, in terms of prevalence, and, and again, these, these data are correcting for or weighted to correct for the oversample of older um, adults. And basically, the lifetime PTSD, one out of eight, or about 12.8 percent, had had PTSD sometime during their lifetime, and we just put popula population estimates for Florida based on the population of Florida or the counties there uh, involved. Um, for major depression, uh, lifetime PTSD was 20 percent, and again, that it's a little high compared to some national figures, and, and again, I'm not sure whether it's because of living in Florida or, or what exactly. And then for uh, past six months, which would be the time frame really since the hurricane, it was 3.6 percent for PTSD. Uh, GAD was 5.5 percent, and major depression was 6.1 percent. And overall, and I think this is probably the most important thing, about Almost 11 percent, we would estimate, of the people in Florida six months after those hurricanes had at least one of those disorders. So that kind of tells you a couple of things. I mean, one of which is that one in ten, I mean, if, the, if it's a population-based estimate, that's actually pretty high, one in ten. But again, these people had been through a lot. I mean, it wasn't as bad for most of them as Katrina and Rita were, but it was pretty bad, and some of those folks still don't have everything back together again years later. Uh, but it also tells you that a lot of people were resilient, which is sort of the good news. Now, uh, here's the genetic sample returns. And, uh, and again, we got 41 percent. Now, this is not as high as we would have liked uh, to have gotten. And we did, I mean, in part because, you know, nobody, this is the first time, to my knowledge, anybody has ever tried to do data collection of this method, using this method in, in a random telephone survey where you've had no relationship with people. It's not a longitudinal thing. It's just like they never heard of you and then 20 minutes later you're asking them to send me your spit, uh, your DNA. Uh, and as John Boyle at the SRBI, uh, the survey research firm, told me, this is not a normal thing to be asking people to do. This is not something they get asked to do. And we did ask why people wouldn't if they wouldn't mind telling us. And it was interesting, usually if you say it's a government survey, that actually increases the, the participation rate. In this case, there were a lot of people who, th there was one person who thought we were trying to clone them. <laughs> I mean, no kidding. Uh, uh, there was somebody else who thought that, um, thought that um, basically, and a lot of people actually said this, that they were concerned that the president was trying to form a secret database of DNA for everybody, which was not true. Uh, but there was a lot of concern about issues like that, and there was a lot of uh, people who just wanted more uh, information. And so we think that we have designed a way to maximize, I mean, to address a lot of the concerns. Uh, and, and one of which is, is that in the future, we're going to, the next time we do a study like this, we're going to set up a website that they can check it out that explains really about the, 
uh, the gene environment interaction stuff and gives more specific uh, you know, information about that. The good news, though, however, notwithstanding a, a return rate that is lower than, than we would have liked, is that basically there did not seem to be a whole lot of differences on some important variables. There were some differences, which I'll show you in just a second. Uh, one of the things is, is that basically people, um, um, th there was a significant age difference. So older people were actually more likely to return than younger people. Okay? Um, there was no difference in terms of men and women returning. Um, whites were actually more likely to return than other groups. And, and actually, uh, I ran across a couple of studies that said that African Americans in general are much more likely, even in the context of ongoing studies, to allow uh, genetic uh, analyses to be done from blood samples that they've given. And it's probably a, a uh, the research community has not always been good to African Americans or other minorities, and so I think there's a, there's a reservoir of suspicion there that, that, uh, that really needs to get addressed. However, with respect to income, there were no significant differences. With respect to uh, social support, there was absolutely no difference at all. With respect to uh, high hurricane exposure, there was just no difference. With respect to uh, mental disorders, there were no significant differences. So even though, I mean, there's, you know, some of these are a little higher than others, but, but they, they were not, even given fairly large sample sizes, these were not statistically significant differences. So we actually had, um, just let me just go through real quickly, you know, what our logic was in terms of doing these analyses. So we'd identified two environmental stressors on the basis of a lot of prior disaster work that predicted who developed these problems versus uh, didn't. I mean, PTSD and, and major depression. First of all, high hurricane exposure is a risk factor. So people who get more exposed are more likely to have problems than people who are not uh, as exposed. And secondly, if you have low social support, so those are viewed as risk factors. And then based on the other work that I was talking about, Caspi and Moffitt's work, that the S allele of the serotonin transporter gene increases risk of major depression, but only under conditions of high stress or low social support. Okay. Now, if the genotype modifies the relationship between high hurricane exposure, low social support, and the outcomes of major depression and or PTSD, we'd expect to find a three-way interaction between genotype, hurricane exposure, and social support for these two outcomes. The prevalence of MD and PTSD should be highest among those with the SS or SL genotype groups but only if they have high hurricane exposure and low social support, okay? And here's, in fact, what we found. We did find a significant three-way interaction. And the, the group um, here, these are the SSs, the short shorts, uh, again, with low production of the serotonin. Um, and again, among that group that had also low social support and high hurricane exposure, 17.6% developed PTSD, which again for a general population sample is pretty high. This is the, the mixed group with the one S allele and one L allele, uh, again with low social support and high hurricane exposure in the middle. And then everybody else is lumped in in terms of the, the, the final group, all other uh, conditions. So basically, this does represent the three-way interaction. So in fact, our hypothesis was really supported in terms of, of finding that. And again, it's a little more complicated for depression than for PTSD uh, in that basically, uh, uh, in that case, uh, it's, it's sort of a different model for the genetics, I guess. And it, it appears that uh, you know, just having uh, one S allele there is, is what does the trick as opposed to having two. But uh, that was also a significant three-way interaction. And by the way, this was adjusting for a variety of other demographics and, and other variables. So again, this is like really hot off the computer printout uh, uh, data. But um, just to summarize it, um, I would say that it is, it is feasible to conduct 
uh, these RDD studies with biological comp components after disasters. Um, that the prevalence of post-disaster PTSD, MD, and GAD were substantial if you figured that about 11 percent of the people uh, you know, had these in, you know, after, in the six months or so after the disaster. And then the, and I think we did find some support for our hypothesis about the, the gene times environment interactions being important and that uh, and to some degree the LL genotype as well as the high social support were protective factors even given the high hurricane exposure. Um, again, I, I, I personally find this gene environment interaction stuff fascinating. I tend to get uh, overly engaged in things that I find fascinating and maybe push them too far. But I really think that, that this is adding a dimension that will allow us to uh, to look for uh, some things, uh, some protective factors in ways that we haven't before. You have to be careful about genetics. We were very, we were very, very careful in that, uh, in the way we collected this information in such a way that nobody could could link a genetic sample with the survey data, uh, and we were very, very careful about putting all that together. In, in the ways that we could protect that. And, and genetics has, a, I mean, there, there are ethical and human subjects issues around that that are very important. But uh, again, I think that this methodology um, is promising and certainly warrants, uh, you know, some future attempts to replicate things. Um, for the all others, uh, there's none of the, the, the results or give the results for LL, the LL group? Or is the all others LL or a It mixture? would include LL and then just everything else. Again, it's too complicated to, to break out. But in other words, the LL people would be in the all others group. Oh, was there a big effect if you just looked at people who had LL and had low social support and high hurricane exposure? Um, was there a big effect? No. I mean... Uh, I, I, I think the answer is no, but again, I can't remember the exact, I, I mean, the sub breakdown. I mean, by the way, the, the total end for this wound up being um, about 600 for these analyses where we had all of the data. Um, so um, I I'm probably can't really answer your question now. That would be a good group to see, though. It would. You're right. Somebody else? Were there incentives for returning samples? Um, yes, there were incentives, and actually we did a little study on that uh, in which we were, uh, we offered, uh, I think originally a $10 incentive and a $20 incentive, and there was absolutely no difference between a 10 and a 20. Uh, my friends who do this uh, collect biological samples uh, for a living tell me that, uh, that probably if you pop that up to 50, you would get uh, a much better return rate. Um, what, is, what I'm trying to do is to give you some, some, some kind of random thoughts about some big picture issues about the future in terms of disaster research as well as response to disaster. Um, and one of the things is, is that there's a broad range of of different types of responses that we might expect to see after disasters. And that disasters really have the, the potential to affect communities in major, major ways. And that really the effect that a given disaster is going to have on a given community is going to depend on a lot of things, but one of those things is going to be the vulnerabilities of the, the pre-existing vulnerabilities of the community as well as the assets uh, and capacities that a community has. And so that that's an important thing that tends to not get focused on in a lot of research. Um, and so if you think about it at a community level and you think about vulnerabilities and capacities for a community, that you can kind of think about that as a rough balance. And so that obviously if a, if a community has a lot of vulnerabilities pre-disaster versus one that has a lot of capacities, uh, then there's going to be a differential effect there. And it's the balance of those two things 
that all other things being equal will determine what happens. And I, I would argue that one of the reasons that New Orleans and, and, Katrina, and uh, Katrina was so bad was that it, that it had happened to a community that was sort of teeter-tottering on the edge. There was a lot of poverty. There was a lot of, uh, a, a lot of difficulties in the community. And so it had lots of vulnerabilities and maybe the capacities you know, were not as great as they might have been. So maybe that would be, uh, you know, just one, one example. So when you have a lot of vulnerabilities in a community, uh, those can be, those communities with those vulnerabilities can be easily disrupted when you have a major stressor of a disaster. And when there are threats of significant property damage, injury or death, economic loss, and then in poor communities, and, and perhaps that's one thing around the world where you see when something happens in a very, very poor community without a lot of resources, then the effects are going to be more massive, all other things being equal than, than not. On the other hand, capacities are resources that allow communities to adapt, to put things back together again in order to keep functioning. And the stronger those communities are, the better it will be. Now, one implication of this is we need to grow those. In other words, to the extent that government and other kind of social structures uh, help grow these capacities, that can be a very preventive thing in terms of, of helping a community deal with things when, when, uh, when bad things do happen. Um, now, some things that can be um, either vulnerabilities or capacities. Obviously, if you have an unstable government versus a stable government that's proactive and deals with things, that can, can make things either better or worse. If you have a weak economy, what the pre-existing unemployment rate is is obviously something. I mean, if there were a lot of people unemployed before something, then, you know, having a disaster is not going to ordinarily make it a lot better. The SES of a community is going to be a rough indicator of some capacities and ability to deal with things. Time since the last disaster. I mean, I think one of the reasons the Florida people were sort of messed up was because, uh, to the extent that they were, was because they just had these things one after another and they didn't even have time to recover from one before another one. People are very twitchy down in the Gulf Coast right now because many people have not gotten their lives back together and they're just saying, well, how in the world will I deal with something if we get something else happening? Um, social cohesion, I mean, how co cohesive a community, neighborhood, et cetera, is will make a lot of difference. And again, in neighborhoods and communities where people are very close and where the neighbors work together to help other neighbors and that type of thing, obviously that makes it a lot better. Access to health care. I mean, New Orleans, again, I mean, they still don't have, I don't think, they still have an operating hospital. So imagine what happens. I mean, there's usual things that happen to people aside from injuries and whatnot that that happen directly as a function of a disaster. But I mean, how do you operate if you can't get routine, preventive, maintenance type of access to health care? And then insurance options and the percent of the uh, community that's insured obviously makes a lot of difference. And again, I'm, I'm, I will tell you that uh, insurance um, it will either cancel your policy or raise your rates or both, uh, you know, so that and, you know, raise the deductibles and, and, and all of that. And so it makes it difficult, you know, for folks to, to deal with uh, that. But if they have access to good insurance, that can deal with a lot of the, the uh, emotional, not emotional, but the, the uh, economic losses. And protections are things that, are, that we can manipulate to some degree. And it depends on, you know, how much stuff comes in, how much help is given, um, that can really offset a lot of the problems, which I think is one of the reasons why, uh, you know, this disaster was so tough on, on people. I mean, I'm talking about Katrina and Rita, is that, uh, you know, people that needed help really, for the most part, were not getting help. And so that just obviously complicates things. So if you get the aid, it can mitigate disasters. If you don't get it, it can make things worse.
and then all regions of the U.S. and regions of the world and even regions within, you know, probably even the Seattle, the greater Seattle area or wherever you're from, differ a lot too. And so that's going to, uh, again, all things being equal is going to make a lot of difference and should be taken into account as you're trying to assess the, the, the degree of disasters. So what I'm going to do now, I think, let me summarize uh, some information that I have about media. There's a question about whether seeing bad things happen on the media per se can cause or are related to in some way uh, the amount of distress and PTSD and depression that people are having. So in the New York study that I mentioned before, we did some things that specifically looked at that. And uh, to summarize it, People reported afterwards, and I'm sure wherever you are in the United States, if you were sitting in front of a TV, you saw over and over again some of the images that happened. And here's a couple of things that we found. One, the image that was uh, really, really upsetting to people and was most related to PTSD or depression was basically seeing people jumping or falling out of the building that was by far the most upsetting to people. And what we found is among people who, first finding was among people who had been directly affected versus people who had not been directly affected, there was an interaction. And so the number of times that you saw on the media people jumping out of the building or, or falling out of the building was significantly related to the likelihood of having PTSD, but only among the directly affected individuals. So that's one finding. Second finding is that in terms of anniversary watch TV watching, it appeared that for that, uh, the people who developed uh, PTSD, new cases of PTSD who had never had PTSD before, the biggest relationship was, was basically among those who had had some PTSD symptoms but did not meet full diagnostic criteria at time one, but who went on to develop it at time two. Those who had some elements of PTSD, their watching TV uh, images uh, repeatedly, there was a relationship uh, between their likelihood of having new cases of PTSD. So my feeling is it's sort of a chicken and the egg thing. Is it that it's moths to a flame and that people who have problems uh, can't help themselves from watching TV? Are they, are they the ones that have the problems? Or is there any example of just actually watching something and you didn't have any problems before and now you develop the problems as a function of seeing these images? And I would say that I really believe it's more the f um, the former than the latter, but I would say that it couldn't hoit, you know, to tell people uh, that if you're getting upset by watching TV, quit watching TV, turn it off, do something else. But there's also no question that, uh, that we can vicariously experience a lot of negative emotions as a function of watching something vivid like that on TV. So one of the things that we've tried to do, and, and we tried to do it, and I think the media has been somewhat responsive, uh, is to say that uh, media, you can be a force for good or you can make things worse. And uh, one of the things that you might do is you might consider how much education there is in the 50th showing of some gruesome thing that happened as a function of a disaster. And so, uh, and for kids in particular, I mean, I would just say that uh, there's not 100% randomized clinical trial data on this, and there probably never will be. But it stands to reason that, uh, particularly for kids, that, that you know, parents should control what they watch, and you should control what you watch. And you should uh, you know, feel not bad about, well, the definitive studies haven't been done, but to say, look, if you're watching this to find out what's going on in the world, fine. I mean, there's a value for that. But if you find yourself getting, if you're upset already before you even started or you find yourself getting upset, it, turn it off or turn on cable, I mean something that's, or read a book or do something constructive or go for a walk or, or do something that takes care of yourself. So again, uh, I think the jury's still out a little bit um, 
on this, but, but uh, again, a take-home thing that I would say would be that I do believe that it's mostly among people who are already upset, who have some uh, pre-existing due to the disaster problems that are most likely to show that association than people who've not been directly affected, who have not had some symptoms before. Among that group, clearly, the more you watch, the worse it gets and that there's at least some reason to believe that maybe if you stop watching, uh, maybe you'll get better. And so uh, I think with that, I will uh, say that, uh, that we've covered too much in the lesson to possibly summarize right now, uh, but uh, I hope that it's been useful for you, and I believe that this uh, concludes uh, this session today.